I'm Bonnie Herbe. Welcome to To The Contrary, a discussion of news and social trends from diverse perspectives. This week, our woman thought leader is Debbie Allen. Allen recently made history, becoming the first black woman to win the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences prestigious Governor's Award. She received the award at the 73rd Annual Emmy Award Ceremony for her lifetime of work and service and outstanding achievement. In accepting the award, she said, it took courage to be the only woman in the room most of the time. She called on women from Texas to Afghanistan to tell their stories, claim their voices, and claim their power. We spoke with Debbie Allen in 2016 when she was in Washington, D.C., addressing social justice through art and dance. Freeze Frame, Stop the Madness, was a theatrical production by and starring Allen about how African-American lives intertwined with police forces. It's all still relevant today, so we're pleased to bring you that story and more from our one-on-one -on -one interview. I think the arts are very important in furthering the conversation of social justice. When I first came to LA to do Fame, the violence that was happening with the gangs and the police was just something I just could not get desensitized to. And I was always upset every time I would read in the paper of an innocent child that's killed in a crossfire, some child shot because of mistaken identity, or a policeman murder. You know, it was just too much. Actress, dancer, director, and producer Debbie Allen is debuting another theatrical narrative, Freeze Frame, at the Kennedy Center this fall. She hopes the play will bring attention to gun violence and its effect in the community through dance. Freeze Frame Stop the Madness is a fusion of every art that I have mastered and am involved with. It's cinema, it's dance, it's music, it's drama, it's art. But I was going to make it a movie. But then I uh, got busy doing fame and the movie Amistad and a lot of different things. Um, Sweet Charity, I did a lot of things in between, but it, it stayed with me. And um, I made friends with Tommy the Clown who created a whole style of dancing, fight dancing, crumping, battling. And I came up with this narrative. How did you create the, the moods and, and how did you deal with all the stories in the show? Tell us about that. Well, it was very interesting for me. I actually spent a lot of time doing research. I sat with a lot of mothers who'd lost their children. I sat with gang members who were very violent people who trusted to tell me their true stories. I spent time talking with police officers to get their feeling about what they do, how they feel. I spent so much time doing research and then I made a decision on what stories I thought would fit, what made sense, who would be in this picture. So it starts off with the actual horrific murder of a store owner and a gang member fleeing the police. The police are trying to find him and then they come up on a party of a lot of young black kids and there's another guy that's wearing a blue shirt like the suspect and they're ready to take him out because they think he's the one and it's not him. That's when the action stops and we go back and find out who are these people in this picture whose lives are getting ready to change forever. And I play two different parts in the show. Okay. I play the wife of the bishop who has the biggest church in the country, biggest Baptist church, and his son, our son, David, is one of the young people who the story is about. He doesn't want to be a minister. He wants to use his music to enwrap, to connect with his community in that way, do his own way of preaching. And I play a Latina grandmother, Rosanna, who is a gang member herself. And um, I think it's an incredible piece it's a great entertainment at the same time. There's a great gospel scene. There's a, a song I wrote called Jesus is on the line. Um, there's a, a wonderful hip hop scene where they talk about the sky still blue. There's a great hot number with the girls 
called Dance and Snack. There's a lot of great entertainment in the midst of something that is so real, poignant, and relevant. As an artist, did you make this up or did it come through you? You know, it's kind of the, yeah, it came to me because I was passionate. Art is to me, the, the truest artists are people who are very passionate about what they're doing, whether they're painters, filmmakers, dancers, they are telling a truth. Alvin, a Alvin Ailey's revelations will last forever because it was coming out of Texas. It was his truth. It was his journey. It was what he understood. And um, this is something that I've experienced firsthand, living in L.A., coming out of Texas. As a child, I was, I can't even begin to describe what it was like for me to see President Kennedy one day with his hair gleaming in the sun and the next day to see him shot, bloody, and it happened in my state. So I felt like I was a part of it in a way that I can't explain, a, you know, a 13-year-old girl. So it sort of came to me, it did me, and now I'm doing it. Tell me what it was, why 18 years? Well, Even though, you know, it's more relevant with today's news, with, with, it's, it's almost more relevant because 18 years ago, you know, there hadn't been all these police shootings in a row that, well, got, that received the publicity like they're receiving now. Well, let's go back. The freeze frame is longer than 18 years. It's more like 30 but if something is in you, it's like your child. You never give up on your children. And these ideas stay with you until they come into fruition. It's part of, I don't know, that's that Debbie Allen in me. That Capricorn that doesn't give up. My father always said, you're too persistent. You, you don't give up. And that's one of my better qualities. I don't give up. And I will stay with something. So freeze frame is born of me through a lot of discovery, excavation, pain, and a lot of begging and pleading, and still now a lot of uh, touch and go. A lot of people are nervous about it. Some well, people, they're nervous about it that it's, you know, what, that it might be too political. It's not political. It's human. That's what it is. You called it your church? It is a very spiritual thing to be an artist and to dance and to do what I do. It is very spiritual. It comes from a place that is very pure. It comes from a place that is uh, not always very clear. It comes from a place where you must take chances and you bring people in. I've gathered so many young people in what I do. And it's, it is my church. My work is my church. And I love what I do, and I, I think I've been ordained to do it. Freeze Frame tackles many socially conscious issues that have made headlines over the years, from fighting for equal rights to addressing bullying in schools. Tell me about how tough it was to get this play produced and, sh and shown nationally. Well, this is a really very sensitive, topical, relevant subject. We're dealing with gun violence. We're dealing with racial relationships. We're dealing with bullying. We're dealing with, you know, how people address women. It has so many things that are relevant to today. And uh, it's tough because when we're trying to find sponsorship, people are very sensitive. You know, it's a political year. There's a presidential election. You know, we're not saying that this is, this is not a uh, debate that belongs to one side of the aisle or other. This is about American lifestyle. It, it, it takes the viewer into uh, low-income America. You know, it's a day in the life almost of... Well, it's not just low-income America. When you look at African Americans, that's the first thing people say. Uh, David and his father, they live in one of the biggest houses on the hill. It's not that it's low-income. 
It's zip code and it's perception, just like you just said. It is perception. You're perceived that if you're in the black community, like some people in the political trail right now, oh, we're in the worst shape that we've ever been. And that's not really true. You know, we have in television where I work every day, Shonda Rhimes has created an empire that has embraced the diversity of not just ethnic diversity, but more women working than any place I've ever seen in my life. Um, so what it is, is a, it's a look at the challenges of African-American youth, Latin American youth. It even addresses what the police are going through. It is a very balanced conversation. Alan told me this is a very personal issue, one that hits not just close to home, but actually hits home. We got off a boat from Italy. My son just bought his first car, a Mercedes. And he was driving down the street. He got pulled over by the police. In California? In California, pulled into the car and was asked, is this car stolen? This is what we're dealing with. There's a lyric in uh, Freeze Frame that says, there's a new endangered species right here in our homeland. The young, sometimes troubled, hoodie-wearing black man. I mean, what is going on? Why? I was so outraged. And it has nothing to do with me being Debbie Allen on TV, but there was no reason for him to be stopped. He didn't have a traffic violation, nothing. Just stop black while driving. And that's what's happening. Then on the other side, you have you know, policemen who honor the badge. You know, if something happens in my house, <laughs> that's the first call I'm gonna make. But there's so many people who don't honor that badge that shouldn't be there. Allen points out this is not just a black and white issue, but a human one. And in order for change to occur, a conversation must happen among everyone. Now what, so what, and, and again, I mean, it just keeps happening and happening and happening and happening. What do you see as the solution? Well, this is why it's called Freeze Frame Stop the Madness. Everywhere where we do this show, we have an incredible panel discussion. We have got to do this grassroots, city by city by city, and people have got to come together, voice their concerns, and then do something about it. We have to have this, nothing happens without a conversation. People have got to talk. We invited the NRA to come, they're not coming. We want, I wanted them to come. I really did. Why do you think they're not coming? Well, they said that because of the presidential election, they weren't sure if they had the right person to represent the, <laughs> the group. I don't know. I was uh, disappointed. Does that mean there are no African Americans at the, or Latinos at the, at the NRA? Is that what they were saying? This is not about blackness. This is about America. It's not right. about blackness but, or whiteness, no. But this is not a world that's black and white. This is not a world that's Latin and black. This is a conversation that is American. And the moment that we start to start to realize that we are American people, you know, go outside of this country. I do all the time. I've been to the Middle East. I've been to Asia. I've been to China, Africa. You know, when I went to Africa, everyone said, oh, did you feel like you were home? I said, not really. I'm from Texas. I'm home here. But I know my roots. But this is my country. This is my nation. I'm American. And that's where we have to start seeing ourselves as American people and stop all this. Because it, it, it's so interesting to me. After doing Amistad, I realized that very soon in this country, there will be very, there are going to be no pure black people, white people, because we are a fusion. We are a mixture. And that's as it should be. I think that's, you can't stop that. But when artists get into the arena of pushing for social justice, which has political, political aspects to it, what are the, where are the potholes? Where are the, where are the sinkholes in this? What it, well, the sinkholes are how do you raise money to keep it going? Uh, without naming names, I've talked to some really big corporations who want to but their superiors are not letting them until after the election. They know that this is the right thing because this is not, this is coming from a dance 
academy, a dance world. This is not coming from a political uh, leader or advocate that way. I'm dealing with my people, my kids every day. I'm looking at the kids whose lives will be compromised if we don't do something. I don't expect, no one expects their child to die when they go to the library at their own school. No one expects their child to die if they go to elementary school to their class. If Sandy Hook didn't change people's minds, they have got to be reminded, they have to. This cannot, we cannot. America is the greatest country on this planet. We're the leader of the free world that we allow free expression. This is what we want. No one's saying don't have guns. Harriet Tubman couldn't have helped abolish slavery without a gun. That is a truth. That is a fact. But do we need assault weapons on the street? Do we? You know, are, are we to the point where people who are felons or being on the FBI watch, should they be allowed to walk in and buy a gun? What is, I mean, you have to have a license to drive a car. You have to be licensed to be a physician, to give medicine. This is no different. The CDC has proclaimed this as a medical issue, a mental health issue. That is a concern to the people here in our country. We've got to do something. Do you have a favorite scene? I don't. It's impossible to have a favorite scene. I don't know. I think, um, I don't know. I think one of the most important scenes is the church town meeting to stop the madness conversation. And that scene is called the ghosts of Columbine and Sandy Hook. That is, I woke up with this song in my head. The ghost of Columbine and Sandy Hook are speaking. Innocent souls from Charleston are still bleeding. San Bernardino will never rest, not until we fully address the problem as a nation looking for reformation. I don't know. Bravo. <laughs> Um, do you worry you might just be preaching to the choir in this particular venue, theater? No, I don't think I'm preaching to the choir. This is Washington, D.C. You have the cross-section of every cultural, economic, political divide come together that you can think of. I'm reaching out to senators on both sides of the aisle to come and support this project. No. I'm not preaching to the choir because there's not a choir yet singing loudly enough that's making a change. No, I'm hoping that we'll f form a choir. I'm hoping that we'll find a way to create a real choir that will do something. Um, and, and other projects you have in mind? Well, I'll be doing the Hot Chocolate Nutcracker back in L.A. in December where I play a rat, a stuttering <laughs> rat, Bucky. Well, what are you t t talking about, Harvey? I mean, you know, I'm a versatile person. <laughs> um, something that for the families, for the holidays. I'll be doing that. I'm still Did you uh, produce working. that? Yeah, I wrote it and directed it and produced it. Um, I'm executive producing um, Grey's Anatomy. Uh, we had our stellar premiere uh, a little while ago, and that show is amazing to work on. It's it's. Quite incredible to be a part of Shondaland. Incredible. I have long held the rights to, the life rights to Dr. S. Allen Counter, who is the real raider of the Lost Ark. He's a black man who's a Harvard professor and a member of the Explorers Club. He's traveled the globe. He discovered the white and the black Eskimos that were descendants of Henson and Perry who discovered the North Pole. He went to the Suriname, where he's been working for years uh, and discovered a tribe of black people more pure than anything you can find in Africa almost. 
they escaped from the slave ships and went into the rainforest. I want to do his story. So I'm working on that. And I'm also, um, my sister Felicia and I really want to do more projects together. And we are, we've got our hands on some things that we're going to come forward with. I would like to um, create a new ballet for Misty Copeland. Uh, I think she deserves her own original ballet. Uh, I don't know where that will go. And I really, really would love to direct opera. It's the one thing I haven't done. Interesting. Opera. Why opera? I love opera. It's um, As a young girl, when I was uh, the first black student at the Houston Ballet Foundation, and therefore the, the only dancer in the court of ballet, where we danced was at the Houston Grand Opera. And we opened Jones Hall with Aida. And I will never forget the grandness and the majesty of all of that. And I've been a fan of opera since, you know, musicals are great, but opera is massive. It's like, you know, you might have cows and horses on stage, 300 people, glorious music. So I'm very interested in doing opera. I love the production value of it. And if you have the right story, I think it could be, I think I would be really good at it. You know, you mentioned Grey's Anatomy. You've talked about Amistad. Uh, you've done so many other things like directing the African-American Broadway production of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Uh, you've released solo albums. You have a dance academy. Yet you're still best known to many Americans for Lydia Grant on fame, which I love so much. I wear that as a badge of honor and pride. Uh, Lydia Grant is always going to be with me, and I love it that everyone, you know, there's only a few actors in this industry that can say they have that phrase that everybody wants, you know, you're looking at me, you're looking at me, you know, um, uh, what is the Clint Eastwood one? Uh, make, make my, my day. And I have, you want fame? Well, fame costs, and right here is where you start paying in sweat. So I'm like up there with the big guys. I love it. <laughs> um, talk about uh, some of your other accomplishments that you're most proud of, please. I think the accomplishment I'm most proud of is my children. I produced Vivian Nixon and Norman Nixon Jr., my children, and all the children that I work with uh, on a daily basis at the Debbie Allen Dance Academy. But I'm, I love my kids. They're good people, and they're doing good things, and... Um, I'm very proud of them. What are they doing? Well, my son, Norman Nixon Jr., wrote most of the music for Freeze Frame. And he's also a stand-up comedian, something I have to tread with lightly because young people in their conversations and their language, I have to, I have to allow them, but it's not my... He's very funny. And he's going to be doing a show on the Comedy Central Network soon. He's part of a show. Um, uh, we'll see what that is. My daughter Vivian is my muse. She's actually in freeze frame. She plays Eartha, the young girl who could be an Alvin Ailey, but her mother's a drug addict. And uh, Vivian is so gifted and talented. She just has to decide what she wants to do. She graduated from Fordham and was starring in her first Broadway show before she even got out of college. She's somewhat of an entrepreneur. She likes uh, investing in apartment buildings, and uh, uh, she's the co-artistic director of the Debbie Allen Dance Academy, and she's the dean of the early birds, the four to seven-year-olds. So that's her group that she's mentoring that is incredible. And a life of creativity is a family affair. I've grown up in a world with my mother, Vivian Ayers, who's a poet. I've grown up in the world of art. John Biggers was like my uncle. I've grown in the, up in a world of history that I love. And all of that informs what I do. So if you're the real artist, you're informed by everything that you do and everything that you know. I think it's important that artists address what's happening and that we help our constituents, our fans, or our community come to a place of 
understanding or we express for them to the world what they're going through. We help the world understand our community, vice versa, or we include the world. Congratulations, Debbie Allen. That's it for this edition. Let's keep the conversation going on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And visit our website, pbs.org slash to the contrary. And whether you agree or think to the contrary, see you next time. Funding for To the Contrary provided by the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation, the Colcom Foundation, and the Charles A. Freoff Foundation. For a transcript or to see an online version of this episode of To the Contrary, please visit our PBS website at pbs.org forward slash to the contrary. Be more. PBS. <laughs>